Uh, welcome everyone. And apologies for the delay. Uh, and very warm wishes to all those of you who are joining us from all over India and all over the world. My name is Archana Rao, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the second edition of our Future We Want web series organized by Initiatives of Change India. We are live now on both Facebook and YouTube. So if you have any problems with either one, you can switch to the other one. Today's topic is the changing model of leadership. And to help us analyze and understand this better, we are thrilled to have one of India's leading journalists, Neja Chaudhary, with us. A gold medalist in architecture, Neja Chaudhary quit her studies to join Moral Rearmament, now known as Initiatives of Change, to work with a team to build a clean, strong, united India. She started her journalistic career with the outspoken and fearless publication, Himmat. A recipient of several prestigious awards throughout her career, of personal significance to her is the Chameli Devi Jain Award for Outstanding Women, Women Media Person, of which she is the very first recipient. Today, Neerja Ji can be seen on many TV channels and writing for all leading newspapers in India. She was the political editor for the Indian Express and has followed the political leadership of eight prime ministers and states. And, uh, and, uh, and state and national elections for over 30 years. She is well known and highly regarded for her balanced, just and unbiased writing. She has in recent years dedicated more of her time to working with agencies involved with child nutrition and health and is a member of Citizens Alliance Against Malnutrition. I personally cannot think of anyone more suited to talk about the changing model of leadership in today's context. We will have Neerja Ji share her thoughts for approximately 15 minutes, and then she will answer some of the questions that come up on YouTube or Facebook. Please do post your questions and comments on either of these platforms. I would now, now like to hand over to Neerja Ji to talk about the changing model of leadership. Thank you very much, Archana, for those kind words. I want to say that the world we live in is not likely to be the same again. You know, who would have thought even three months ago that a virus would bring nations to their knees and put millions of people out of work, as many as 40 million in the richest country of the world, the United States of America, as many as 130 million, that's a conservative estimate, in our own country, India, pushing economies into recession and some fear it may be years of depression, which could trigger off huge unrest and social conflict. In India, we have seen what we call the reverse migration from cities to villages in the last weeks of a kind not seen since the country's partition in 1947 with millions of migrant labor trudging hundreds of miles with their families, young children to get away from the specter of hunger, disease and death, hoping to reach the familiar and reassuring security of being with their loved ones back in the villages. With many dying on the way, crushed under a train or in road accidents, or because of lack of food or water. The world is going to remember 2020 for COVID-19, but in India, we will remember it also for migrants, the long neglected underbelly of urban India, and which is going to be a defining image of our battle against coronavirus. You know, after, even after a vaccine has been discovered or drugs found, which will be effective. And even if the virus mutates and becomes more benign, which many of us hope it will, we will live with the fear of another such virus hitting us two, three, five, 10, 20 years down the line. So life will undergo a dramatic change that we will be working more from home, that there'll be more of digital learning and homeschooling, 
hopefully also for poor and tribal children who don't have access to things like Wi-Fi, or that more and more of e-commerce companies will deliver us what we need. All this is given already. Overall, it will be back to the basics that much more. Hunger and food security and health will dominate public discourse in the time to come. But creation of livelihoods will be the burning issue. Many of us are already reviewing, thinking about the kind of develop mod mod development model that we have opted for, the role technology, technology should play in a future scheme of things. How do we create a just and a humane society where there is food and quality education for every child and equality of opportunity for all? And how do we learn to live in harmony with nature instead of a rapacious attitude towards natural resources that we have had, much to our cost? Equity and environment may emerge as the big themes of the future. The leadership that people may seek worldwide to tackle the new challenges may well be different from the leaders we have looked up to in the past. And this is already beginning to happen. Now, I would like here to look at three sets of examples of the changing model of leadership to illustrate what I want to say. One is from the US, the other from India, from Kerala, and third is of women leaders in many countries who have managed to contain COVID-19 more effectively than their male counterparts. You know, many of us, certainly in Delhi where I am at the moment, many of us have been tuning into CNN at 8.30 every night to watch New York Governor Andrew Cuomo in action. Over the last weeks, he has emerged as a folk hero, even though the New York State has registered a large number of corona deaths. To me, it's been a fascinating study in what the new leadership could be all about. Cuomo has been transparent about the situation. You know, he addresses this press conference flanked by his deputies, medical doctors on either side. But he's been honest about the situation as it existed, no matter how unpalatable. He has led from the front. Repeatedly, he said that if things go wrong, it is who, who, he who will take the blame. And above all, he has gone into the nuts and bolts of every plan he has put into place. If the underground rail had to be sanitized, which was the novel idea, how and when it would be done, what would happen to the homeless who took shelter there, what would be the alternative shelters built for them, who would build them, where the money would come from, and all these little details. You know, if a COVID positive person was turned away from a hospital in New York, where would the person be sent to? Which is the other hospital the person would be sent to? How would the person get there? And so on. So a system was sought to be put in place. You know, in India, we're very good at what is called jugar, somehow managing to piece things together. But the devil is always in the detail, and it is this detail that has to be mastered for the success of any plan, any project that gets underway. And if the leader is hands-on himself or herself, he or she will create confidence in the people and attract the best people to his or her side and command their loyalty. Now, another thing I found very fascinating about Cuomo was that he hoped for the best but planned for the worst case scenario. Of the several agencies that you know projected how many people would actually get sick and need to be hospitalized, he planned for the worst scenario. And I think lining up as many as 1,40,000 hospital beds, and it was only a small fraction of those that needed to be used so far. But as he put it, it was better to be prepared than to be found wanting. And there's much we in India can learn from there. And he could say with confidence 
that no one died because of the absence of a hospital bed or a medical treatment not being available. That is why, that is this nuts and bolts approach is also the reason why the Kerala model as it's coming to be known is also being acclaimed internationally. Now there is this doctor, uh, this, this sorry, not a school teacher, she's called teacher Shelja. That's the way she's popularly referred to, but she's the health minister of Kerala. Hardly charismatic looking, hardly flamboyant, hardly the kind of leader we have all opted for in the past in various countries. And, you know, she comes from a family and she has said that her family, her grandparents fought against untouchability. So she comes from one of those communities in the state. She's backed by her chief minister, also hardly charismatic leading the government there of the Marxist party. But the early response of this leadership, their contact tracing, their, you know, they first heard of Wuhan where there are a lot of Keralites there and they immediately bucked up and uh, went in for preemptive measures. They put out, uh, made provisions for food to be given to the poor, early announcement of a financial package, Given their social welfare approach, a strong public health infrastructure, which had been built over the years in Kerala, which is now standing them in good. Today, any Kerala going back to the state and, you know, people are in about five to six lakh more people of my Kerala origin are expected to go back, whether it's from other countries or different parts of, the, of India uh, in the days to come, weeks to come. And they have worked out a system where they have a portal where you can register. Once you've registered that I'm coming by this flight or this train or this by road on such and such a day, you will be met there and the whole system has been alerted about your arrival. I know somebody who, who was pregnant and wanted to deliver her baby uh, in Kerala. So she flew back home. This was only three days ago. And she was met at the airport, she and her husband, she was working in Bombay and given a package. The packet contained exactly where she would be staying. It was a home of an NRI given for quarantining people with seven bedrooms. She was going to be in one of the bedrooms. The car that would take her there, the money she must pay immediately online. If she couldn't pay the money online, then she could transfer it very soon, but she could leave the address. When she was, she uh, went into, the, she called for this car, the car had a partition between the driver and the passengers. And en route to this house, she got a phone call from where she was going, this house, to say, what is your preference for a meal? Will it be this or that? You will have to pay 45 rupees per meal and there. Next day, she was in, she, uh, the local panchayat people got in touch with her, whether she was all right. Later, the health department got in touch with her to track her, uh, you know, well-being. So look at, you know, it's amazing. To me, the leadership of the future is going to be hands-on. This is the kind of leadership we will be uh, uh, looking at. And people, I feel, will, have, will increasingly have a greater appetite for leaders, not only those who are uh, uh, known for good oratory, but who are known for good delivery. So I think that is the change we will see between the past and the future that lies ahead. Very quickly, I want to make this point of the women leaders around the world. It is very interesting to note that countries which have women in leadership roles today have fared better in containing the virus than other countries. These are countries like New Zealand, Germany, Iceland, Finland, Denmark, Taiwan, and several more. Now, this has been noted around the world. Articles have been written about it, and it really calls for a greater study. But the question that cannot be wished away is this. Do women bring certain qualities to the table which imparts that added plus to leadership? Compassion, empathy, patience, listening to people, collaborating, 
with them with possibly greater ease maybe because they've had to do this over a period in families and take everybody along not bring things to a breaking point in the interest of the larger good which also results in a more pragmatic approach in india we have by law a large number of women from 30 to 50% in the local bodies which is the third tier of government and it's been found over a period through studies that women sarpanches tend to spend more on basic issues like health education food than on infrastructure which men tend to do now some have called this a feminine management of situations clearly we need women more and more women in leadership roles and i have often said this that the 21st century is going to belong to women to the women of india and particularly to the young women of india to bring the changes that we now will need and yet women are amongst the most vulnerable in society i would say women and children when there is a crisis and they are the ones who suffer the most and now in the times to come if a fa if family income will go down which it will a girl is more likely to be pulled out of school or married off at an early age married off as a child and i hope you know that this doesn't happen but much of the progress that we have made in recent years whether it's to reduce child stunting or to increase the age of the marriage of the girl much of this is going to get nullified unless things change dramatically i now very quickly want to go over and we all have views about the qualities and traits that will be needed for the changing leadership of the future i want to just flag off uh, five six points as i see them for one awareness of the issues that are going to dominate in the months and years to come two responding to a situation around you and not waiting for others to take the initiative leadership is taken not given leading from the front and having the courage to take responsibility when things go wrong instead of finding scapegoats for conviction and an inner leading about what you are going to do five an ability to connect with people like i said como could get across to the tough new yorkers in the richest city of the world and he could bend the corona curve with their cooperation because he had the pulse of the people six putting a team in place an ability to take the people along and work with those you disagree with or you don't like seven compassion and empathy eight as i've said again and again so far above all working out the nuts and bolts of any plan now i want to actually very quickly to wind up yeah uh, my final thing i want to just final comments i want to make i feel a crisis deepens the fault lines in any society in any family in any community it can bring out the worst but it can also bring out the best in people and the present pandemic could well throw up heroes in every byline of india i believe this where does it leave each one of us what is it that we can do more than we have been doing do our goals need to be bigger and our inner resolve stronger does it mean a reordering of our priorities in the light of the new situation and the compelling needs of society and these today have life and death implications what does it mean at the personal level at the professional level as a collective wherever we are at work and a willingness to forge new partnerships even with people who we would not have considered working with earlier i want to end on a personal note if i may in 1947 our family came to india as migrants from then pakistan 
we came as refugees with nothing and had to rebuild from scratch. Our parents concentrated on two things to the exclusion of all else. Good and nutritious food for the children and a good education. We were not allowed to see a film, maybe once in three months, but could buy a book. I remember not being allowed to buy shampoo, but there was no skimping on food. Today, the entire family has made good all over the world. And I feel every child in India must get nutritious food and good education and an opportunity to really go for the stars as her right. And I, whatever remaining years I have, would like to put my weight behind that goal to mobilize, to mot motivate, to equip those who will give the next 25 years of their life, if need be, to achieve that goal and not give up till it happens. Thank you, Archana. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm, I'm actually a little bit moved by the last few words that you said. Um, thank you very much, Major Ji. Um, and your your last last few lines were were very very moving. And I think um, in the world that we are in today, uh, to see the, the the things that we're seeing on the media and the stories that we're hearing, uh, to have a commitment like this to uh, to have make it the right for everyone to have the opportunity to go for the stars, um, it's it's a beautiful beautiful dream, and I hope we can make it a reality. We are we have a lot of people uh, who are, who are commenting, uh, and we have a few questions that have come in. Um, I will read out the first question for you, and then maybe I'll give you a sort of brief overview on some of the comments that have come in, uh, and you might like to respond to the comments. This question is coming in from Keshab Daha who is uh, in Nepal. He says, thank you for your valuable time and insights. In your opinion, what are the few things an individual should keep in mind during election and while voting so that there is a chance of an equitable leadership and government which is willing to listen and understand its people who are different on the other, in quotations marks, side. Do you want me to answer this now? Yes, he's not. yes. Yeah, now this is a very difficult one because I would say immediately, I please vote for somebody who's upright, honest, credible image and who you feel is going to do something for society. But things are not as simple as that. You may have a motley group of independents who may not be able to make a difference if it's a parliament, parliamentary system. So you also are, are governed by the consideration of voting for a party with a certain manifesto, a certain uh, public agenda, and uh, the issues they are committed to. And yet you keep hoping that parties will put up, <laughs> parties of the right, left, center, will put up better people, more credible people, the kind of leaders you really look for in society now. I hope it will happen. <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> thank you. Um, we have a comment. Uh, firstly, I, I must say a lot of people uh, were saying more power to women leaders, more power to women sarpanches. So this is a lot of people acknowledging that um, women leaders are doing a good job. So thank you very much for highlighting that. Uh, Duren Bhuta makes a comment saying, we need to consciously remove barriers for women, especially those from poor and traditionally marginalized communities. Um, Virendra Shukla uh, makes a comment uh, saying, character and emotional intelligence and execution are critical to leadership roles. Uh, Viren also talks about, I would suggest dealing with a VUCA model. I kind of remember what that is. Um, Praveer Bagrodia is talking ask him about- to, ask, him to uh, Achina, ask him to spell that out. That's very, very interesting, those four words, four letters. VUCA. Uh, Viren, if you're still watching, would you mind uh, spelling that out? Or if someone can just give 
screenshot or send me something on WhatsApp, I'll read it out um, live. Um, from uh, Jane Rai, Nisha, you have made many thought-provoking comments and insights for the people of the world and India to take away and act. People in India have the political will and commitment to achieve many meaningful objectives. Thank you for sharing. Um, we have a question from Salil Roy. Post COVID-19, how would inclusiveness influence in creating leaders for tomorrow? I think inclusiveness is very important. You know, whether inclusiveness of the kind as uh, I think, uh, was it Biren or somebody else who said, from communities who have been on the peripheries, who've been on the margins, who need to come up front and lead. They are the ones who need to lead the, our society, our politics, our, uh, you know, give economic lead and so on. Uh, so that inclusiveness has to come because they have not had a chance. Uh, then there is community in uh, inclusiveness. You, you know, we've been worried in recent months of the kind of divide, uh, religious divide and communal divide that has been seen and the minority community feeling quite beleaguered and insecure. So you cannot, you know, with the kind of mega challenges that are going to be there, as I said, on basic issues of hunger and health and food security, you cannot afford to have divisions of this kind and exclusion. You will have to put your best foot forward and everybody on board uh, and not have some feeling insecure and threatened. So inclu inclusiveness is extremely important for the changes we want to bring. Thank you. Um, so uh, Biren and uh, Madhavi Kupachi have both uh, elaborated what VUCA stands for, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. I wonder, uh, Nijaji, if you'd like to speak about that or should I? take the liberty to ask you a personal question. Well, those four, four uh, words are going to be governing our future. They're going to be like a cloud over our heads, something we'll have to contend with and live with and learn to overcome and do what we have to despite all these four words. Indeed. Um, so we have a question from Sunny. Uh, many leaders might get away with excuses and we have already seen many meticulously drafting their blame report. How do we hold such leaders accountable? And as ordinary citizens, how can we contribute to a society and a leadership that is equipped and resilient, not just economically, but one that is just and ethical? I think how do we deal with leaders who are, you know, now into the blame game? And it's, it's been sad, you know, we started off well, even though, you know, when the lockdown took place, the prime minister took a very difficult and tough decision. Then he reached out to the chief minister, something that would have been unthinkable six months ago, you know, having five sessions with them, one of a couple of them going on for six hours, eliciting their ideas. But of late, things have you know, degenerating, degenerated into this blame game, center blaming the state, states blaming the center. And it is very sad though, you know, the issues at hand, it's a very unprecedented situation, very difficult situation, the like of which we have never uh, uh, dealt with. Uh, and, you know, how much, how much importance do you give to saving lives and health issue? How much importance do you give to uh, opening up the economy? If you don't do that, if you don't have economic activity, people will die of hunger and so on. So that is a very difficult dilemma. Uh, then you didn't expect, you didn't anticipate migrant labor uh, hitting the road. But once you put the trains out there to take migrant labor back to their villages, then, you know, the big issues are difficult. Yes, you can say you, there'll be mistakes, there'll be uh, problems in, uh, you know, uh, dealing with you know, this vacillation between life and livelihood. That is a difficult one. But to have a train, some hundreds of trains in a country which uh, ferries 23 million people every day in normal times, which is moving around 
the population of Australia, 161 year old organization uh, with one and a half million people working, considered efficient, and you can't move them with just food and water to their destinations. To such an extent, you know, where the young children have died, these images will go, that have gone viral will haunt us for all time to come. It's not something we are going to live down very easily. So I think it is this blame game, which has been responsible for the railways not having done what they should have done, and the state and the centre not acting in tandem, which has led to loss of life through things like hunger and dehydration, which should never have happened. We have no dearth of water or food or milk. We have those uh, trains going there. So I think uh, the blame game can be very, very costly and it's been painful in the last days to witness this. I hope the state governments and the center will get their act together and move in step in the coming days. Thank you. Um, yes. <laughs> Hope so too. Uh, we have uh, we have many more questions coming up. So I'm, I'm just taking a few. Uh, uh, the next one is from Asma Abdullah. Do you know if there are women leaders in the non-Western world or Asia who are taking charge like their sisters in New Zealand, Finland, uh, Germany, etc.? Well, we have them in India. You have a Mamta Banerjee <laughs> fighting away. Uh, you, you uh, of course, uh, you have a Mayavati, you have uh, several others here. You had a Mehbuba Mufti, you have Sonia Gandhi, um, and several others. So I'm talking about India. So also, you know, you have them in countries of South Asia, other parts of the world. And I think, uh, I think this really requires a deeper study. Part of the reason in the countries I mentioned, of course, there are smaller countries, uh, uh, is also that they have uh, much more of an egalitarian societies that they have built up, which could also be that they elected women leaders and those women leaders, of course, brought to the table those qualities, but could also get the support and collaboration of the people. So I think this is a very interesting thing, a very interesting development that is a phenomenon that is coming to the fore. And I think a deeper, greater study is needed into it. But the bottom line is certainly clear, more women in the leadership roles. Here, yeah, here. Yeah. Um, maybe, I think we, we're coming close to time, but maybe we, given that we start a little bit later, we can take a little bit more time. Um, so this is a question from Dr. Archana Shukla. Uh, as a normal citizen, how can I help migrant laborers in any such way that they should not migrate again to the urban areas? Well, I don't know whether that is going to be possible that they don't migrate to the urban areas. I, I wish industry could be relocated nearer uh, where they are. I wish there was, uh, there was a way that decent housing could be given uh, uh, to the, these workers where they work. You know, I, I really wish what we could do is to rebuild Dharavi. The Dharavi has become a symbol of everything that's gone wrong, our neglect of these workers, their families, the conditions that they've had to live in year after year after year. And we've all been party to this. And as a way of uh, making amends, is it not possible to build a brand new Dharavi, get the best of India on board, get the corporates on board, get young people on board, and do you know what housing should be like without the land sharks getting into the act? There'll be many people who want to take over that land, prime land, without that happening. But certainly, yes, uh, even the children of these migrants, I was also thinking, you know, uh, that image of this 18 month old child trying you know to wake up his dead mother is something you know it's something very um, very what's the word painful and is there not a way that at least for the children of those migrant labor who had to trek back home in such painful circumstances that we at least can ensure 
that they be taken care of at least till their schooling is over now can we do, do we create an organization uh, can you know something like ma can the rest of india be like a ma to them mother to them uh, i don't know i'm just thinking from speaking from the top of my head but yes i absolutely agree with you that we owe something to them and their children thank you um this is actually um a question that i have and um maybe this could be the last question that uh, you answer neeja ji uh, my question is that you talk about uh, heroes rising from the bylines um how do you see uh, what what examples have you seen that have happened uh, at the moment of people from the from the public uh, rising up to do things and uh, where do we need where should we be doing more and what should we be doing two things quickly archana uh, there was a tweet from priya dat uh, who was in power former parliamentarian and she said her a person who used to work with her have decided to go home and she let him go and as he you know moved through on moved through maharashtra only she said he wrote back of these amazing sights of hindus muslims sikhs just coming out in the roads and feeding people these were ordinary people just feeding those who were walking i know somebody in unicef bombay they he decided you know something had to be done and this for five six of them got together uh, what to do for the migrants within a few days there were 100 of them they had managed to mobilize funds uh, they had managed to get metro the shoe company to donate good solid footwear for the walking migrants and they had got somebody to give air fare for 131 passenger migrants to fly back to their homes and all within a matter of days so there's huge desire to help all over india forget the governments for the moment they will or will not do what they have to do but this is where leadership comes into the picture i feel something strongly i take the initiative five people will join me that five will become 100 many others will rally around that is what leadership is about follow your inner lead and do it courageously ah thank you that was uh that's uh, I, i think in many ways a challenge to all of us you've told us how you've told us the qualities that we need as leaders um from uh, andrew cuomo to kerala to uh, women leaders around the world and you've given us a dream to uh to make sure that everyone has the right to dream for the stars um and that we can do it and you we've got examples of people who can do it thank you very very much uh neeja ji for this extremely inspiring um and moving talk